Hello and welcome to the first 7 Blue Pixels tutorials where we take some of the tools and techniques out of some of your favourite online trends. Today we'll be looking at Doctor Who and even though it's not necessarily an online trend, the title sequence has been trending. Since the injection of Disney budget, the production levels in Doctor Who have skyrocketed and the title sequence is a prime example of that. So let's have a go at making it. We'll be using Cinema 4D and Pyro, which is the flame simulation system inside Cinema 4D, and we'll be using it to make the volumetric time vortex to which the TARDIS travels through. These skills are transferable to any other software that uses 3D, such as Houdini and Blender, because we'll be basically making VDBs. So, without further ado, let's get into it. So, I'm in a new Cinema 4D project, and the first thing I want to do is change my frame range of my frame per second down to 25. That just helps me with the maths later on. I'm going to increase my frame range to 100 frames. And then as we go into our render settings, I've already got redshift selected. And I'm just going to change that to 25 frames as well. So everything's matching. Perfect. Okay. So firstly, what we need to do is actually generate how we're going to have the pyros work. So let's go into here and we grab a helix. Now with our helix, this is looking great. However, we just want to make a few adjustments. Uh, because we're working on a slightly bigger scale, allowing us to use a slightly higher voxel uh, centimetre range. So we're going to get enough cloudiness and range so that we still get enough detail in our final time vortex. So I'm going to change these to 300, the radius. So what you'll see here is happens is I type these in and press enter. They go much larger. Okay, so I'm just going to do that on both. So now we have a much wider helix. Secondly, what I want to do is just change the start angle. So for example, the further I go up, the closer that spiral comes in and the further I come down, the more angles we get into it. So if we set this to something like 350, minus 350, we get a nice view there. And then if we, for example, just increase this to uh, 1500 and here we are ready to work with. So what's next? So if we come up to here and we go primitive and we go sphere, we're going to go up to here and we're going to right click on that sphere and we're going to find a tag and it's going to be an animation and line to spline. So what we're going to do now, we've got that here, and we've got it activated in our attributes window. We're just going to move the helix down into the spline path. As we get our position dial here, we're just going to move that, and we can see that go pretty much from start to finish all the way around our helix, which is great. That's exactly what we want. So we're just going to set a couple of keyframes here. So we're going to go keyframe here, and we're going to go to the end, and we're going to set 100% here. So that when we play it through, we see our sphere going through. However, we don't want it to start slow and end slow. We want it to have that kind of petrol motion all the way through. So if you click on this dial in the corner here, that's, that will open up what's called a dope sheet. So now we have that open and we just make it bigger here. We can actually see our timeline and our keyframes. So if we hit H, we can actually see the full timeline here. So we've got our aligned, uh, aligned to spine keyframes here. And with them all selected here, we're just going to go up to here and hit linear. Now, if we play this back, you'll see it starts very quickly and it will end with the exact same motion at the end. So now we have a somewhat perfect loop regarding the animation. So now we have that, we can start going in and we can start thinking, okay, well, how are we going to do this? It'd be great if we could fill up the volumetrics from the center here. However, doing it with one sphere is not only going to take a lot of processing, but also it's going to take a, a lot of time to kind of actually make sure that we have this thing filled with enough smoke that it doesn't dissipate over time as well. So let's add another sphere. So if we hold control or command and we get this sphere and we scroll it down. Now we have this sphere. This one's going the exact same way. We just have two spheres going the exact same way. Let's close this for now, which is fine. Great. But we can actually make this more interesting. So if we go at the end and we just swap the position details, hitting that little diamond to make sure we hit the keyframes correctly. Now they will spin and they'll meet each other in the middle. What we want them to do is not go all the way. We want them to kind of somewhat meet in the middle and just slightly pass each other like that because their smokes are going to interact because we know that we're going for a tunnel vision approach. So the camera is pretty much going to be straight down here. So we know that we only really have to feel enough for the camera to be focused on. Let's bring this out and let's change our aligned splines. So the one that starts off at 100%, we're going to get to the end and we're just going to change that to 45%. And the other one, we're just going to change to 55%. So what happens now is that they both start and then they'll both overlap and then just come to a, a stop. However, 
caching 100 frames of volumetrics is just going to be an absolute pain. So we don't really want to go with that. So if we open up our dope sheet again and we bring this over, we have 100 frames here. Let's just say, let's go for 35 frames. So let's bring these all down to 35 frames. Look at that, fills really quickly and then it stops. Pyro, what is Pyro? So Pyro is Cinema 4D's inbuilt uh, flame simulation and it can be used for a lot of great stuff. And today we're going to use it to build the volumetric cloud data that we're going to be using to build the time vortex. So if we go up to, if we turn off this second sphere, Alt and double clicking, so we get the two red traffic lights and that just hides it from view. Brilliant. So we go to the top one and we're going to leave it all procedural in case we ever want to change anything. And we're going to go to simulations and we're going to go to pyro emitter. So what you'll notice up here in the corner is that it also has a pyro output, which is great. So basically all that is pyro output opens up pyro scene here and we have all of our settings here. And the exact same thing as pressing control and D, command and D, simulation, pyro. It's just a very quick way to get to those output data. If we start our timeline again, we're going to see it plays back like that. And we're starting to get, we can start seeing what we're building here. We can start seeing this, those smoke trails and that, that ball of fire. We can start actually getting a sense of how we're going to be creating this. As we go into this, we're thinking, okay, so we want a little bit more detail than that, but we don't want too much. If we drop this down to say two centimeters voxel size, it, it's a lot slower caching. We get a hell of a lot more detail, but for this instance, we don't need so much detail. However, five was too little detail, so we're just going to go to four. It's not necessarily split in a difference, but if you have a look here, we have a lot of detail, a lot of really nice smoke data, and we're starting to get those puffs of cloud. If we scroll down, we've got other settings that we can use to optimize pyro as we go through. So if we open up the tree settings, you can already see the paddings on two. So what this does is that it just increases the complexity of the simulation, whereas if we drop this down to one and we start again, it's a lot quicker and we're not getting as much smoke, but we don't need as much detail. We need the density, but not the detail. So that's a great option for us. As we go down into general, we start seeing density of buoyancy. Now, this is uh, effectively just a, like a gravity mod. So the higher the number is, the more the smoke will sink to the floor. The lower the number is, it has a inverse reaction and it floats into the air. So if we just leave this as minus 10 for now, that would be a nice one to go with. So if we just play this back, yeah, it gives the smoke a nice kind of little uh, kind of puffing out uh, as it follows the velocity of the sphere. Let's go down to density. Relative density dissipation. This is the main one we're going to be looking at here. So the higher the number it is, if I just do this, for example, 27, and we play it back, higher the number is, the quicker the smoke disappears. Now that might be really what you're looking for. If you're looking for like a speed character, you know, you're looking at Sonic or Flash kind of going through street, that might look great. It's kind of dust picking up or anything like that. But for our purposes, we want a lot of smoke to build up because we're looking to build an environment. So we need a lot of smoke to build up. But we don't want this, we don't want the whole scene to just be smoke. So if we drop that down to maybe 3%, if we right click this arrow here, it takes it back down to the default. Density dissipation slider is very sensitive as well. So we don't need to drop it down that much. For example, if I put it back to seven and we play it through, we can see what we get and it's starting to trail off by the time it gets around to the second loop. However, if we drop this down to 3% and play it again, it's still there by the time it's halfway around almost the second loop. So this is exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for a lot more smoke. You can see that kind of building up. You can start seeing how we're going to be generating that environment, that time vortex. So we're not necessarily going to be looking at color and we're not necessarily going to be looking at temperature. We're not, we're not looking at kind of actually uh, manufacturing a flame simulation. We're looking at more how do we build an environment from it. However, we have more settings. So if we go into our pyro tag settings here in the corner and we click on that, we get a whole lot more data. So if we scroll back to the top, we have a lot going on here. So we could change the emission type. So if we change that to volume, that will use the entire sphere as the volume. And as you can see, we get a different smoke simulation. It's kind of leaving it behind and it's generating it from inside the normals. But let's just leave that on surface for now with a thickness of 10. The default value is working great for us. And as you can see, it's all on the outside and it's kind of getting blown with it as it moves along. So that's looking, that's actually working well for us. Density down here, density set. So this is just how much uh, kind of cloud we're going to get. So if you think of density as just smoke, 
that would be the best way to think about this. So for example, if we move that up to one, that's zero as it is in the center. And if we play it back, that's set to one. So we're getting a hell of a lot more cloud data. And that's kind of exactly what we're looking for. So we're definitely on the right path with all this as we go forward. We can start looking at fuel. Now fuel is a very interesting one. So fuel is obviously the thing that's going to be igniting this. So if we play this without any fuel on, you can see that's exactly where we are. It's just got the emitter and that's where we go with it. But if we turn fuel on and we leave it as a fuel set of 10 and it's continuous, we start getting something a little bit Oppenheimery, and it's just absolutely intense. It's absolutely insane. And yeah, it might work for what you're looking for, but that is just craziness. We don't need anything near that level of detail. So, and let's change it to maybe a fuel set of one. Like I said, these gauges, these sliders are very sensitive. So if we go back to one, and as you can see, this is actually giving us more detail, more cloud data, but without anything that's going to be really over the top. So we're definitely on the right lines with this. However, we don't want it to go all the way through because when the uh, sphere stops in the center, all it's going to be doing is just generating smoke. And now it's just going to be sitting there, generating, 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 generating. And yeah, that might work for you if you're actually building something or you want something to be in the center you know, this kind of cool looking cloud thing, but it's just not what we're after. So what we want to do is that we can change the settings here. We can go to drop down, we can go to frame range. Now within this frame range, I'm going to set this to start on frame one and end on frame 10. So by the time it gets to its 10th frame, the fuel will start going away and it will just be left with the density. We're going to leave constant pressure on and that will kind of give it a little bit more energy to it. So as we play it back through now, we're looking from the side. As you can see, we have that initial burst and then that density of smoke covers on flying through and we're not getting anything burning up too much at the center here. We need the velocity, we need to set to movement. Defaults are looking great to me there. As we go down into turbulence, octaves is effectively just a level of detail of what you want in your turbulence. So I'm just gonna knock that up to 12. And in scale, scale is uh, effectively how big or how small that turbulence is. And I'm going to drop that down to about 100. That should be fine for our purposes here. And as you can see, simulation is nice and quick. We're moving things along and we're starting to get the look that we're after. That's the most important thing. Optimization and look. So now we've got those things settled. What we can do is that we can control click and drag our pyrometer tag down. Line everything else up. And we could turn it on the other sphere. So... As we come out and we scroll back like this, now we have both spheres. They pass each other and we have everything starting to puff out and look really great. However, as you can see in the center now where the camera would be looking, we have two big balls of fire and that's just no good for anybody. So what we wanna do is that when we get to 35 frames, we're going to select both of our spheres using shift select and we're going to click the diamond next to radius and we're just going to go five frames and we're going to drop the radius to zero. This is effectively turning those uh, balls of fire off. We're scaling them down to the point where they no longer exist and they will no longer be emitting or noticeable uh, emission. So as we go through again and we play this through, as you can see, simulation is nice and quick, ball scale down and look at that. We have a nice tunnel of smoke. We've got a few little gaps, but they might work really well when we put the lights in. So this is looking, this is exactly where we want it to be. Now, what do we do about trying to actually make the smoke come back into the center of the cylinder rather than go out? Well, the answer's there. We put a cylinder in. So as we get our cylinder, we just need to change a few things. So if we set this to minus X, that will put it along the X axis. So if we change the radius to 500, that should fit all of our smoke. If we go back to the center, that definitely fits our helix and leave all the fire in. So that's exactly kind of what we're after. If we come up to the top, we click right click, render and display. We can go to display tag, use and put this down as lines. So now we can actually kind of see roughly what we're doing with this container. And that's effectively what it is, is a container. Times this by 10 on the height. And now I'll extend the length out. And then if we drop this back by, I'd say, holding shift as you use the uh, moving button there, it's the move axis, we'll go about 750. And that fits it nice in the center there. That's looking really great. This is now just acting as a thing. As we play this through, 
it's not actually affecting the smoke. The smoke is still coming out from the top. So how do we stop this? So if we right click again and we go to simulation and collider, we can change it to the collider side to back. So the collider slide affects the normal. So the normals are basically what side of the face is your uh, object looking at. So at the moment, the front would be looking out and the back would be looking in. So we want everything to be reacting to the faces looking inside of the collider. We go back and we can even hide this now. We need to make sure the uh, cylinder is active. So we leave the tick there, but we can put our two red traffic lights there. Top ones for viewport, bottom ones for render. And as we play through, we're starting to see at the top here, the cylinder traps some of that smoke. And now it's starting to fill out. As it gets trapped at the top, it's starting to expand out. Now you can see we've got this really great looking time vortex thing here. If we zoom in here, it's just starting to look really cool. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So what happens if we're ready with this? Well, 100 frames is a lot to cache. We're not looking to do 100 frames because we need to turn it into a VDB. And each one of those VDBs can be, depending on your level of detail and everything, a massive file size. Now, because we need the last one, um, we must, we, we've got to cache the whole thing. However, we'll end up just using the last one. So you can delete the data afterwards. So if we just drop this down to 50 in the frame range, and we go up to our pirate output here, and we go to cache, we're going to click enable. You can set your file name here, and we're just going to cache scene, okay? We're going to find somewhere for it to live. So we're just going to go into, uh, we're going to make a new folder here and we're going to call this tutorial, oh, I can't spell, tutorial cache. Brilliant. And we're just going to pop it in here. What do we do with this? So I'm going to select all these, press Alt and G and put them in a group. And I'm just going to name it Pyro, okay? Just so that we have it. But we don't necessarily need it. So we can turn the Pyro output off and we can hide the rest of the data there. So now we have it and we'll be using Redshift. Let's go into this little green icon here. We hold it down and we go into Redshift Volume. So Redshift Volume will allow us to bring in a VDB. So we go into our path data and we look for our, and we look for our VDB. We have it here untitled, I perhaps should have saved. Please be saving all the way through. Please, please, please be not leaving it to risk like I am. <laughs> And we just go into number 50. That'll be the last frame that we have here. So if we go over to number 50. And as you can see here, it's just a bounding box. There's nothing interesting about it. If we drop down to points here in the corner, we can see we've got 10 points. So let's maybe drop that up to 50. And so you can start seeing that we're starting to see where our volume may be. But it's not the best representation. So what we do is we go into our Redshift render view and we just dock it here on the right hand, left hand side. And we just go into this. Nothing shown. Not obviously. You'd be sitting there thinking, why is that? And that's a very reasonable question. Uh, because I did. So what we need to do, we need to go into our materials manager. We need to go into materials and new pyro volume. So if we just drag that up to the RS volume there. Now we're starting to see what the volume may look like. How do we start lighting this? How do we start approaching this into what we're looking for? Let's grab a camera. And let's put the camera down first. So I like to do a higher millimeter camera. Let's go 100. And let's look through the camera. And then just bring it back out a bit, right? So now we have, you know, almost like a full blocked out scene here. If we, for example, for the sake of this tutorial, do exactly what I did on my one, just block it into a square. And then we just bring the camera in a bit more. Now we start filling out this whole environment here and we can actually start looking at how we can position this camera. So let's say, for example, we're happy with this here. What I like to do, just to make sure I don't do anything wrong, is I'll change this up here to the Redshift camera, and I'll go right click on here, and I'll go down to Rigging Tags, and I'll go down to Protection. This means that whenever I'm in this, I can't move the camera at all, so I'm not gonna cock it up in any way. Let's come out of our Redshift view, uh, Redshift camera view, and as you can see, we've still got it here, so great. How do we now do this? So let's grab an area light. And as you can start seeing how we can start affecting this light source. So as we bring it out, we're starting to be on the outside of the volume. And as you can see, the light is coming in from where we had those gaps in the spiral. So if we just bring this up and we just build kind of a little barn door like that, you can start seeing how we're affecting this. But if we bring this back into the center a little bit more, you can start seeing how we can start building 
different kind of patches of light where it might come in. And you can play around with all different lights. So for example, we can come in and get a point light and we can just bring this one up and we can bring it over here, for example, and we could bring it back a little bit and let's just increase the exposure, something wild, right? So let's just go, uh, let's go 110 on the exposure, right? Let's just go, let's go absolute wild. But now look at this, we have like a hotspot. So that would be really cool if we bring in our Cineware data and we attach a null to that, we might be able to get some, you know, electric assets or something during the compositing stage and actually build up some particle effects or kind of any additional effects to help fill in the gap for this. So that's starting to look really great for us. Now, as we come back out, we're looking to actually have that curve and in the title sequence, the TARDIS goes round. So let's build that. All we're going to do is get our RS volume here and we're going to control drag down. I'm just going to bring this back. As you can already see, it's brought it back. And we're just going to bring the angle just something very gentle, let's say 15 or so. If we go into our move tool and we press W, this little icon up here changes from local to world coordinate system. And using the world, we can just bring this back in and we can try and just re-angle this a little bit so you can start seeing that we have that extra tunnel at the back here. And now we know that, we can go into our point light here. We can control click that down. We can change this color. Let's say, let's change it to, you know, like an orange. Just so we've got like a hot sun looking thing. And we can just bring that back to the back here. And as you can see, we're starting to get that glow. So if we just bring that in. And bring it closer and closer. Look, now we're starting to get that glow on the outside. So now let's, what happens if we turn this up? And let's maybe drop the exposure a little bit and let's just actually just play with the intensity. So now we're starting to actually build out our volume a little bit more and we can continue building it out and out and out. And that is how we're gonna build our time vortex. The last thing you might want to look at whilst you're here is if you go into your pyramid volume material, you can actually go into the scatter coefficiency details. Mm -hmm everything else that you got going on here. So for example, I might change the tint to something like a, like a pinky kind of color. So let's go maybe go peach more. And now you can see that actually changes some of the detail there. So if we go into one of our lights here and we change this to, I don't know, let's go really extreme. Let's go blue. And then let's just change this one to like a green, right? Now you can start seeing, we're getting very interesting dynamics and very interesting colors. We can start actually shaping this how we want it to look. So for example, if we bring up the area light to maybe just a thousand intensity, now we're starting to get a very interesting look. If we put a bit of bucket rendering on just so we can see it in high quality, you can start seeing the level of detail that we're getting. And you can see how we didn't need so much detail and smoke because we're using the lighting to help generate that through. As we go through as well, especially in the volume details here, we can go into the absorption details and you can just kind of change that. So as we go down, we change the bucket rendering off here. You can start seeing how we can affect how it might work. So if we kind of bring back the absorption, some of these are really extreme, but you can see how we can start having these, these clouds suck in that light. Again, we can come up here to the density and we could just take out that light almost completely. Just the level of detail that it comes through. And we can also just have it so that it lets in so much more light so you can build something where you can also uh, kind of go in and just completely change the look of this. So once we're happy with this and we want to bring it to After Effects, how do we do it? Because we want to keyframe all these lights, but we don't know how we want them. And once we've rendered them and baked them out of Cinema 4D, they're, they're done. So is there a way we can manipulate these lights for when we take them into compositing? I'm glad you asked. So if we go up into our render settings, and we go into Redshift and we go into Advanced and we go over to AOV. So in our AOVs, these are basically uh, the different passes that you'll be able to use in After Effects, perhaps using an OpenEXR file or, you know, whatever your chosen thing is. And as we go into here, we've got Beauty and there's our main pass. But if we click on it, we have Light Groups and Global AOVs. What does this mean? So within the Beauty pass, there will also be different light groups that you can assign and then you can adjust how they are looking. So to do that, we click on whatever light we want. We go to details 
and we click on there, we go to add new light group and we're going to call this green point light. See, it's been added here. We do the same with this one. We go into here, add new light group. I'm going to call this blue area light. And then at this one, we're just going to call this background sun light because we know that is going to be representing our, our sun or our portal, whatever it may be. So you can go through each and every single one of these, for example, like even diffuse lighting and pick what you want. But let's just keep it with beauty for now. And we want all light groups. So if we select this, it will just do all the light groups. And then we just have the full choice of what we're looking for. So for example, I won't bring this into After Effects for this tutorial as it goes slightly out of the scope of what we're doing here. But if I open up our Redshift renderer here and I go into our bucket rendering, you can see now that we have our different light sources. So for example, if I go to beauty back sunlight, that's all we're going to be seeing is our beauty back sunlight. And that looks great. And then we can go into blue area and we can just use this. And the same with the green. And then what we can do in After Effects is that we can adjust the opacity, exposures, levels, curves, whatever we may want. And we can get different effects where if you look closely, we're actually getting the whole lighting area. You know, we're starting to get all these little details on the right here as well. And that would be really powerful. So you get to somewhere where you can build this. And that is effectively all I did for this time portal. As you can see, if we break down the main project here, is that I have lots of different lights. I'll turn them all off, whoop. And it just goes back to exactly what we had. We had the red, and then we just go one area light. We've got a purple on the left. We've got a blue kind of ambient light. We've got a big sunlight at the back. We've got a little kind of blue purple light in the bottom left, little high highlight. Again, highlight at the back, highlight at the back. And we just got all these wonderful lights here and that really gives us the effect and then we can change those how we want again i only have three volumes so if i for example come out of the camera view here oh yeah you can see how that tunnel is starting to take effect there but if we go back into here and we go into main cam you can see all it is is just three volumes attached together turn them off volumes go turn them back on we've got the volumes back and that's as simple as that I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you've learned something new. Let me know if there's anything you want me to cover in the future. Let me know if this has been helpful and I look forward to seeing you next time.